In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come away from the Gospel lessons of these last few weeks with encouraging words from our Lord. Throughout Easter, Jesus was with his disciples, fulfilling all that he had promised before his crucifixion. When he returned to the Father at his ascension, he promised once again that he would remain with his church. And so he did. For he promised to send the Holy Spirit, that great Comforter, who would bring many to the Lord. Then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, who was promised, appeared, and was with the Church, bringing Christ to her once again. Finally, we heard in last week's Gospel reading this same promise of Christ. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And indeed, Jesus is. For he remains with his own through baptism and teaching, through that great commission he gave to his Church. All in all, these were comforting gospel lessons about, le- about what life would be like after Christ left this world. They said that Christ is with us, will remain with us, and by the Holy Spirit we will remain with him. It all sounds pretty good. But then we have today's gospel reading. And to be frank, what Christ says, or promises if you will, of how things are going to go in the life of his church isn't altogether very encouraging. Christ initially says some curious statements that probably aren't too outrageous. He says there'll be no need for supplies. Rely on what's given. All right. Next, he says, heal, raise, cleanse, and cast out. Um, sure. And then he really gets going. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. You'll be dragged into courts. You will be flogged. And there it is, what we've all been dreading. But Christ says the harvest will be plentiful. Oh, but the laborers will be few. Well, that seems fairly obvious. Why would anyone sign up for this? Why, what kind of discipleship is this anyway? And who ultimately would want to follow this man and this life he is describing? Well, the answer is nobody. Given the option, we'd prefer not to follow Jesus and what he has to say in sacred scripture about the life he calls his people to. I know that sounds out of place and almost bizarre, because we are Christians after all, shouldn't we want to follow Jesus? Well, yes, we should, but we do have to ask ourselves this question. Do we actually want to follow the Christ we encounter in Scripture, or is the Christ we'd like to follow simply a Jesus we've created? One who fits our needs and demands, one who doesn't disrupt our lives and opinions, and one who really isn't all that different from who we are. I think we all know the answer. We prefer our version to Jesus over the Jesus we find in Scripture. Because in the end, the Christ we read of in the Gospels is at times fairly uncomfortable. And we've certainly all encountered that tension which comes with him and what he has to say about the life we should live. It's that tension you experience when confronted with following Christ or following the world. Perhaps it is that you don't initially feel conflicted with the demands of Jesus, For at first, the life of a Christian disciple seems pretty rewarding and noble. You know what it looks like. It looks something like this. Love, pray, and do good. Who would have much of a problem with such a life? But when the specifics of such a life appear, things get difficult. Because who should you love? Your family and friends? Sure, that's not so hard. But what about when they betray you and hurt you? Or what about when you betray and hurt them? How then do you go about loving them? And if that doesn't seem difficult, what about Jesus having you love your enemies? Or praying. That's certainly worthwhile. But what about when you don't know what to pray for? When you can't even find the words for what frustrates and pains you anymore? Or you're simply too tired of praying for the same thing repeatedly? And then you have Jesus come along and in the middle of your praying troubles say to you, Pray for and do good to those who hate and persecute you. And so now to that doing good part. Or as Christ would have it, be perfect. Be a perfect father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, boss, worker, friend, neighbor, and citizen. And you aren't simply to be perfect in those relationships and vocations. You are also meant to forgive those who are not perfect. To forgive those who have been imperfect. Fathers and mothers and sons and daughters and husbands and wives and bosses and workers and friends and neighbors and citizens. And even to forgive those who hate and persecute you. Yes, when we are honest with ourselves, the life Jesus calls us to puts us in impossible situations. But typically, we do not welcome honesty. 
We prefer not to think about what makes us uncomfortable, and so we ignore what's going on, or we fool ourselves into thinking otherwise about who we are and the life we should be living. For consider that religious zeal of those Israelites and their response at Mount Sinai when Moses gave them the covenant. Did you catch what they said to Moses and the Lord in our Old Testament reading for today? Oh yes, we will. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Oh really? Let's not cast stones at them, though. We aren't too far behind. Because we do catch ourselves saying, Oh yes, we will follow, Lord. Just lead, Lord. But where are we following Christ to? Where does his life lead? It leads to the cross. And so although we'd like to think we follow Christ, when we get right down to it, the cruciform life he calls us to isn't the one we want. And it isn't the one we live in accord with. Because as it is, we do hate our enemies, we do forget to pray, and we do good mostly to those who'd only do good back to us. Or, we demand perfection from those around us as we fall very far from that same standard. And the kicker in all of this, that despite all this sin and failure, how often do we have the audacity to look around and filled with much pride and think, well, at least I'm not doing as bad as some of these other people. Well. What are we to do with all this? What are we to do with our fickle and, hypocritical, fickle and hypocritical behavior? Well, we are to repent and to turn to Christ. Because it isn't going to do any of us any good to pretend that we can make amends for our behavior, or that we haven't done anything wrong. And neither is it any good to think that one day we will finally overcome. That one day we will be perfect Christians and disciples of our Lord through our own doings. This isn't what Christ is looking for anyway. The life of discipleship and following Christ is a life of honesty. And that's what Christ wants for us. That is why it is a life lived in repentance. It's about hearing the Holy Spirit calling you back to the true life. For when you feel that tension in your spiritual life, when you feel that conflict between following Christ and following this world, when you feel that turmoil as your flesh wrestles and pushes hard against the Spirit, that tension and conflict are the Holy Spirit calling you to honesty, to admit who you truly are, and then to turn where true, and then to turn where true life is found. That is what repentance is. Repentance is about being honest. It's about being honest and saying, Yes, Lord, I am a sinner. Yes, Lord, I am in need of much grace and mercy. It's about hearing that kingdom of heaven which is at hand and heeding its call. What is the call of the kingdom? It's the call of St. John the Baptist from Advent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the king of the kingdom, Christ himself, draws near to you. It's the call we heard in Lent. It's the call we hear throughout the entire church year, because it is simply the call of the church. Repentance is what it means to follow and heed Christ. It's the way of discipleship. Loving, praying, and doing good are marks of a disciple, to be sure. But to be a repentant sinner, ultimately, is what it means to be a Christian and a disciple of Christ. This is so because repentance is what puts us on the same path of Christ, the path to the cross where we too die so that we also would live again. Repentance is to confess in our lives we are the persecutors and not just the persecuted, that we are the wolves who deceive and trick and who bite and devour one another, that we are the ones who put people on trial in the court of our own minds with our own judgments. Because yes, we probably don't drag people before kings and rulers, but we certainly do take on that role ourselves through our own condemning thoughts and words when we assume the worst of others and when we then delight in our superiority. Yes, there is indeed much to repent of. But that's the point. Jesus sent the disciples into the world for that purpose, to turn the hearts of sinners to their Redeemer. Christ sent those first twelve disciples into this world. He sends his pastors to you this day to give himself to you. For he was the Lamb of God who came into the midst of a world of sinful wolves. He was the one hauled before Governor Pilate and King Herod. He was the one flogged by men and devoured by death at Calvary. Jesus lived that life and still sends his pastors to us some 2,000 years later so that the life he lived would be our life. That through the call to repentance, through the preaching of the gospel, the washing away of sins, and the feeding of his body and blood, we would be his and live his life which he gives to us. That we who are the wolves would ultimately be turned into sheep, and we who are surely sinners would be made saints. Jesus was for us what we could never be for ourselves, a perfect son of God. A son who in obedience and love followed the life his father called him to. And so he did. And so he gives that perfect life to us in a free and undeserved gift of grace. 
He does this not because he needs a way to deal with a bunch of unruly sinners like you and me. Jesus died and lived not because he needed to make an excuse for us all. He became a man not because we were good people or righteous folk who needed a little bit of help or an example or because we had any redeeming qualities in us at all. Jesus did this simply because of his love for us, because he wanted to, because he wanted us, and because we need him. Jesus forgives us because he actually wants to forgive us. He died for us because he actually wants to give life to us. That is the gift that Jesus sent his disciples to give and to preach to this world. That is the gift your pastor still imparts to you this day, the gift of life. That is the gift given whenever the kingdom of heaven is at hand, whenever Jesus, its king, is at hand. For the healing and the cleansing, the casting out of demons, and the raising of the dead we heard much about in the gospel lesson for today were not ends in themselves. They were signs that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, that the Lord of life was present, that Christ was making life out of death and sin. The kingdom of heaven that the disciples were to preach of is still at hand today, even in this very church. For when you repent and receive the forgiveness of sins, Christ and his kingdom are at hand. When sinners are brought to the waters of holy baptism, when the people of God are gathered around the preaching and his altar, there his kingdom is present. And it is in this kingdom where things you thought you never could do happen. Things Christ has given us all to do. Helping, praying, forgiving, serving, and loving. And never perfectly in this life, to be sure. But when you fall and when you sin, when your spirit rages against your flesh in this world, hear again the call of your Lord and return to his kingdom. For that is where you belong as a disciple of Christ. You belong in his kingdom, and that is why he has brought you here today. For we don't come here on Sundays to just visit the kingdom of God. No, we come here on Sundays to live in the kingdom of God. And by God's grace and mercy, we do. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.